Hello, and welcome to this month's Video Tech. As you can see, our technician has just finished performing a road test on the subject of this month's program, the ZF automatic transaxle used in Eagle Premier and Dodge Monaco models. Later in the program, we'll be showing you some of the road test and diagnostic procedures used on the ZF transaxle. But let's start the program by taking a look at the design of the ZF transaxle, and then we'll take you through some basic in-car service procedures. The model ZF is a four-speed automatic transaxle. First gear ratio is 2.58 to 1. Second gear ratio is 1.41 to 1. Third gear ratio is 1 to 1. And fourth gear ratio is 0 0.74 to 1, providing an overdrive range. One unusual feature of the ZF transaxle is its longitudinal design as opposed to the transverse design found on most front-wheel drive transaxles. Because of its longitudinal design, the ZF transaxle and PRV V6 engine combination make a compact package in the engine compartment. Another feature is that the transmission and differential are contained in the same housing, although it's important to point out that the two are separated and require different lubricants. We'll discuss fluid specifications in more detail in just a minute. You'll find the transaxle identification plate located on the driver's side of the case just above the oil pan. The information on the plate consists of the build sequence number, the manufacturer's part number, the factory where the transaxle was manufactured, and the transaxle type. The number 4 designates a 4-speed transaxle, and the number 18 designates the transaxle type. Before we get into the service part of the program, it's important to note that service procedures on the ZF transaxle are limited to removal and installation and minor in-car service. Currently, major service on this transaxle is not allowed during the 770 warranty period. If you have questions about what service procedures you are allowed to perform, be sure to check the 1990 Premier Monaco service manual. When we come back, our technician will demonstrate the basic transaxle service, beginning with fluid level checks. Having the correct fluid level is crucial to the operation of the ZF transaxle. Because the oil level is sensitive to temperature, you should make sure the engine and transaxle are at normal operating temperature before checking the level. Never try to check or add fluid when the transaxle is cold. If the fluid is cold, start the engine and allow it to run at idle until the cooling fan cycles three times. Hold the vehicle with the foot brake while slowly shifting the transmission through all gear ranges. Then return the gear shift to the park position. If the vehicle was recently driven, it's important to allow a 30-minute cool-down period before performing this procedure. With the engine warmed up and operating at curb idle speed, our technician can go ahead and check the fluid level. Transmission fluid is checked and filled at the same point in the engine compartment. You may find that some dipsticks have a full cold indicator. Ignore this indicator. Also, don't try to get the fluid level to the very top of the cross hatching. Add fluid in small amounts and keep checking until the level is somewhere within the cross hatched area. The only fluid recommended for the ZF transaxle is Mopar Mercon automatic transmission fluid. The service manual lists two fluid capacities. The refill capacity, 7.4 quarts, is the approximate amount required to fill the transaxle after major repairs. The fluid change capacity, 2.8 quarts, is the approximate amount required to fill the transaxle during a fluid change only. Under normal service, 
The transmission fluid and filter should be changed every 30,000 miles or at 30-month intervals. If the vehicle is subject to extreme service conditions, such as driving in stop-and-go traffic, long idling periods, frequent short trips, or operating at sustained high speeds in temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit, the fluid and filter should be changed every 24,000 miles. If you need to drain the transmission fluid, you first need to raise the vehicle and remove the underbody splash shield. Then, drain the transmission by disconnecting the fill tube at the oil pan. Loosen the nut, attaching the fill tube to the oil pan, and drain the fluid. Remember that the differential is separate and requires its own lubricant. The only lubricant recommended is Mopar 75W140 Synthetic Hypoid Gear Lubricant. Drain the differential by removing the drain plug located at the bottom of the differential cover. When the oil has finished draining, make sure you use a new washer on the drain plug. Then, install the drain plug and tighten to 18 foot-pounds of torque. The fill plug is located at the left center section of the cover. Remove the fill plug and add lubricant until it starts to flow out of the fill plug hole. Then, install a new washer on the fill plug and tighten to 37 foot-pounds torque. The capacity of the differential is 0.66 quarts. Under normal circumstances, the 75W140 synthetic lubricant is designed to last for the life of the differential, and periodic lubricant changes are not needed. Well, that about covers basic service procedures on the ZF transaxle. In the next part of our program, we'll be looking at service diagnosis. <laughs> When a vehicle is brought in with a suspected transaxle problem, it's essential that you carry out three basic checks before performing any diagnostic tests. Number one, check the fluid level and condition. Correct fluid level is essential for transaxle operation. Testing with an incorrect fluid level may further damage the transaxle and give misleading or erratic test results. Number two, Check the shift and throttle valve cable adjustments. Incorrect adjustments can cause the transaxle to operate in an abnormal manner or cause damage. Number three, check the engine and braking systems for normal operation. Many apparent transaxle problems are eventually traced to performance problems in other systems. Check number three is self-explanatory. Let's look at checks one and two in more detail. When checking fluid level, also make a point to check the color and condition of the fluid. The fluid should be dark red to light red in color and free of dirt or debris. If you check the fluid and find that it's a milky white color or the radiator overflow tank is contaminated with transmission fluid, it's likely that the oil cooler is leaking, allowing coolant to mix with transmission oil and vice versa. If you check the transmission fluid and find that it is dark or discolored, or that the fluid smells burned, you'll need to remove and flush the oil cooler, then replace the filter and change the fluid. The first step is to raise the vehicle and remove the splash shield. Then, drain the transmission fluid as shown earlier. The oil pan is removed next. It's held on by four clamps. Remove the nuts securing the oil pan, then remove the oil pan and clamps. The oil filter cover is removed next. It's held on by nine bolts. Remove the bolts, and then remove the oil filter and cover. Remove the oil filter from the cover and discard the filter. Next, remove and discard the oil filter cover gasket. With the pan removed, now is a good time to check the magnet and the bottom of the oil pan for debris. If the oil is discolored or burned, but is free of dirt or debris, and if the transaxle was operating normally, you can go ahead and change the fluid and replace the filter 
then road test the vehicle to confirm that the transaxle is operating properly. But if the transaxle was not performing normally and the transmission fluid is black, dark brown, or burned, and especially if the oil contains large quantities of metal shavings or friction material particles, the transaxle will have to be replaced. Installing the oil pan and filter is the reverse of the disassembly process. Remove the old gasket and clean the oil pan. Don't forget to install the magnet in the circular indentation in the pan. Install a new gasket on the oil pan. Never use a spray type sealer as this can destroy the gasket's ability to seal properly. Before installing the oil filter gasket, smear the gasket with petroleum jelly. This will help hold the gasket in position when you install it on the valve body. Install the oil filter and cover, and when you've verified that the gasket and cover are aligned, install the oil filter cover bolts finger tight. The bolts are different lengths and must be positioned in a hole of the corresponding depth. This is important because there's only a small difference in the lengths of some bolts. To avoid damaging the valve body, be sure to check the service manual for the correct bolt positions and torques. With the oil filter cover bolts tightened down to their correct torques, you can install the oil pan and clamps. And use a torque wrench to tighten the clamps to 54 inch-pounds of torque. Connect the oil fill tube to the oil pan. Be sure to coat the threads with Mopar Teflon Thread Sealer. Then, tighten the fill tube nut to 75 foot-pounds of torque. With the oil pan and filter installed and the fill tube tightened, you can go ahead and refill the transaxle with fluid following the quantities specified in the service manual. Now, once again, I can't overemphasize how critical correct fluid level is to the operation of the ZF transaxle. If the fluid is too low, it allows the pump to take in air along with the fluid. Air in the transmission fluid will cause fluid pressures to be low and to develop slower than usual. On the other hand, if the transaxle is overfilled, a situation develops rather like this blender filled with transmission oil. The gears in the transaxle churn the fluid into foam, aerating the fluid and causing the same conditions that occur when the fluid level is too low. In either case, fluid level too high or too low, air bubbles cause fluid overheating, oxidation, and varnish buildup, which interferes with valve clutch and brake operation. Foaming also causes fluid expansion, which can cause fluid to overflow from the transaxle vent or fill tube. It's easy to mistake this overflow for a leak if your inspection is not careful enough. Finally, a safety warning. You should never try to pressure test a transaxle. The ZF transaxle operates at very high pressures, much higher than most transmissions you're probably familiar with. Pressure testing without specialized equipment can be very dangerous. Under no circumstances should you attempt it. Well, that takes care of two of our three basic checks. The next basic check is the adjustment of the throttle valve cable and shift cable. The adjustment of the throttle valve cable is essential to proper shifting. Improper adjustment can cause clutch slippage. If this condition goes unchecked, it will eventually destroy the transaxle. Let's have our technician demonstrate the throttle valve cable adjustment. For this procedure, you'll need to fabricate a special tool, a 39.5 millimeter gauge block. You can use a vernier caliper for this check, but it's difficult and it's awkward to position it correctly. It's a lot simpler and much more accurate to use the 39.5 millimeter gauge block. Begin by loosening the two cable lock nuts and lifting the threaded cable shank out of the engine bracket. Make sure that the throttle lever is in the curb idle position. Pull the cable forward and place the 39.5 millimeter gauge block on the wire between the throttle lever cable connector and the slug on the cable end. Now. Pull the cable shank rearward 
until you feel it hit the detent position, but not to the wide open throttle position. You should be able to feel a definite stop when you reach the detent position. Hold the shank at the detent position and insert it in the engine bracket. Then tighten the lock nuts to lock the shank in place. Remove the 39.5 millimeter gauge block and verify the adjustment. The detent position should be reached when the cable wire travel is 39.5 millimeters plus or minus one millimeter. Later in the program, we'll be showing you the procedure for removing and replacing the throttle valve cable. Finally, the last item to be covered by our three basic checks is the shift cable. Remember that the shift cable positions the valve body manual valve. Incorrect adjustment can cause creeping in neutral, premature clutch wear, delayed engagement in any gear, or a no start in park or neutral positions. Adjusting the shift cable is fairly straightforward. Before raising the vehicle on the hoist, make sure the gear shift lever is in park. With the vehicle on the hoist, you'll be able to access the shift cable from below. The shift cable is held in place by the shift cable adjustment clamp. Release the shift cable from the adjustment clamp by pressing the lock tab outward. Next, move the transaxle shift lever rearward into the park detent which is the last rearward position. Make sure the lever is centered in the detent. You can verify that the park lock is engaged by trying to turn the drive shafts. If the drive shafts cannot be turned, the park lock is properly engaged. Lock the shift cable by pressing the adjustment clamp back into position. The clamp should snap back into place. When the vehicle has been lowered again, Turn the ignition key to the lock position and verify that the shift lever remains locked in park. It should not be possible to move the lever out of park. Some 1990 vehicles equipped with floor shifts may not have this interlock feature. Now turn the ignition key to the on position and verify that the engine starts only when the shift lever is in the park or neutral positions. Next. Make sure that there is a detent for each of the shift positions. Then shift the transaxle back into the park position and verify that the ignition key can be returned to the lock position. The final check would be to verify proper transaxle operation by road testing the vehicle, which leads us into the next major portion of our program. If you performed all three basic checks, and the problem still exists with the operation of the ZF transaxle, the next step is to road test the vehicle. Observe the operation of the transaxle and then diagnose the fault using the charts found in the service manual. Road testing is often the quickest and most accurate way of isolating a problem in an automatic transaxle. During the road test, you should operate the transaxle in each gear range and check for slippage, shift variations, harsh and spongy shifts, and speeds at which upshifts and downshifts occur. Listen closely for engine speed flare-up or slippage, which usually indicates clutch, band, or overrunning clutch problems. The key to diagnosing the source of a transaxle problem during a road test is to know which elements of the transaxle are in use in the various gear ranges. The application chart in the service manual provides a basis for analyzing road test results. Road testing and use of the clutch band brake application chart provide a means of diagnosis by the process of elimination. Using this process enables you to pinpoint the malfunctioning component. The service manual also contains diagnostic charts. If you found a problem with the operation of the ZF transaxle during the road test, you should look up that condition in the diagnostic charts, find the cause of the problem, and then carry out the recommended corrective procedure. For example, if during the road test you found that the transaxle was shifting directly from first to third without using second gear, the service manual diagnostic chart lists a sticking shift valve as the possible cause. 
and recommends correcting the problem by replacing the valve body. Replacing the valve body is a fairly straightforward procedure. It's necessary to remove the oil pan to gain access to the valve body. We've already shown you that procedure. So when we return, we'll join our technician as he's about to remove the valve body itself. Before you begin removal of the valve body, be sure to shift the transaxle into manual first gear. This will help later on when installing the new valve body. With the car on the hoist and the oil pan removed, you're ready to remove the valve body. It's held in place by these bolts. It's not necessary to remove the oil filter and cover to get the valve body off. Remove the valve body bolts and remove the valve body as an assembly. Remember, the valve body is serviced as a complete assembly. When installing a new valve body, there are three steps which make the installation process a lot easier. The first step is to move the selector lever rearward into manual first gear detent. This is the last detent in a counterclockwise direction. Step two is to pull the throttle cable to the wide open throttle position. This helps avoid jamming the throttle cam and piston during valve body installation. Step three is to push the manual valve all the way into its manual first gear position. Carrying out all three steps ensures that the valve body will be correctly installed. Before our technician goes ahead and installs the new valve body, I want to point out that the bolts used to hold the valve body in place are different lengths. When installing the new valve body, it's very important that you use the correct length bolt in each hole. As you can see, in some cases, the difference in length between bolts is slight. Be sure to refer to the valve body bolt chart in the service manual for bolt locations and torques. When you're absolutely certain the bolts are in their correct locations, tighten them to the torque specifications called for in the service manual. Once the vehicle has been fully assembled, you should road test again to verify the repair. A faulty valve body is just one possible cause of transaxle malfunction. Our next road test covers a different problem, a broken throttle valve cable. Suppose the road test showed the transaxle to be shifting normally, except that the transaxle did not kick down when the accelerator was fully depressed. The service manual diagnostic charts lists the condition, suggests an incorrectly adjusted throttle valve cable as a possible cause, and recommends correcting the condition by adjusting the throttle valve cable. Earlier in this program, we showed the procedure for adjusting the cable. However, if you try to adjust the cable and found that the cable was broken or stretched beyond adjustment, you'll need to replace the cable. To remove the old cable, Loosen the two cable lock nuts and lift the threaded cable shank out of the engine bracket as shown earlier. And disconnect the cable from the throttle lever. Before you can disconnect the cable from the transaxle, you'll have to remove the valve body using the procedure shown earlier. With the valve body removed, you can access the throttle cam to which the valve body cable is attached. Disconnect the throttle valve cable from the pin on the throttle cam. Then, Fit a 10 millimeter socket to a long extension and use the socket and extension to push the old throttle valve cable out of the transaxle housing and remove the old cable from underneath the vehicle. Before installing a new cable, be sure to lubricate the O-ring with transmission fluid or petroleum jelly. Then push the new cable back into the housing until it snaps into place. Next. Connect the cable to the throttle cam. With the cable installed in the transaxle, you'll have to go back into the engine compartment to reattach and adjust the cable using the 39.5 millimeter gauge block as shown earlier in the program. The next step is to verify the correction by road testing the vehicle. And check for full throttle kick down by flooring the accelerator pedal. Our last condition involves a missing shift. Suppose during the road test, 
you notice that the transaxle was missing third gear by shifting directly from second to fourth gear during acceleration and jumping directly from third gear to first during deceleration. The service manual lists two possible causes for a missing 2-3 or 3-2 shift condition, a sticking or contaminated governor or a sticking 2-3 shift valve in the valve body. In each case, the suggested correction is the replacement of the governor or the valve body. As the sticking or contaminated governor is the more likely cause, it makes sense to check that component first. In order to gain access to the governor and governor support, the reduction gear case must first be removed. Make sure the transaxle is in neutral before raising the vehicle. You'll need to remove the cross member, disconnect the exhaust pipe Y tube, and drain the transmission and differential. Remove the engine mount and bracket attaching it to the reduction gear case. Then remove the 12 bolts attaching the reduction gear case to the transaxle. And carefully remove the reduction gear case along with the gasket. With the reduction gear case on the bench, begin disassembly of the governor by removing the spring washers. Make a note of the position of the four spring washers. Later on, during assembly, it's very important that you install the washers in the same position as they were removed. Next, remove the governor cover. And then remove the governor. With the governor removed from the case, check for plugging of the passages drilled through the governor body. Also check for stuck valves. In our case, this stuck valve was causing our missing 2-3-3-2 shift. While the governor is out of the case, check the governor's support for grooves or indentations. If wear or damage is evident, you'll need to replace the support. Before attempting to remove the governor's support from the case, it's important that you back off the oil pan stud. The end of the stud protrudes into the case. If left in place, the stud could groove or damage the seals on the governor's support during removal. To do this, you need to remove the oil pan nut and clamp, then double nut the stud and back it off until it clears. Begin removal of the governor's support by removing the support retainer bolt and spacer. Then pull the governor's support from the case using tool numbers 6149 and 6149A. Note the position of the two oil seals at the forward end of the support for assembly reference. Use a screwdriver to remove the seals from the support. A word of caution. Seal position is very important when installing new oil seals in the governor support. Install the inner seal with the seal lip toward the rear of the support. Then install the outer seal with the seal lip facing out. Install the inner seal in the support using tool number 6157 and driver handle C6091 or C4171. Install the outer seal using tool 6158 and the same driver handle. Next, install new O-rings on the support and lubricate them with petroleum jelly. Install the new governor into the governor support and then Install the governor and support into the case as an assembly. Replace the support retainer bolt and spacer and use a torque wrench to tighten the bolt to 17 foot-pounds of torque. Then install the governor cover and spring washers, making sure the spring washers are in the same position as they were originally. Lubricate a new gear case gasket with petroleum jelly and position the gasket on the case. Do not use any kind of gasket sealer on the gasket. Use only petroleum jelly. Install the reduction gear case. And tighten the bolts to 17 foot-pounds of torque using a torque wrench. Don't forget to screw the oil pan stud back in. Then replace the clamp and tighten to 54 inch-pounds of torque. Finally, replace the differential drain plug and fill the differential with Mopar 75W140 synthetic 
high-point gear lubricant. When you've filled the differential, installed and tightened the differential fill plug, and then installed the oil fill tube and filled the transaxle, the next step is to check the repair by road testing the vehicle. You'll find all of the procedures covered in this Videotech program in both the service manual and the student reference guide. You'll also find other in-car service procedures we didn't have time to show. As you can see, there are quite a few service procedures you can perform on the ZF transaxle without having to remove it from the vehicle. Once again, though, before attempting any repair, be sure to check the service manual to make sure that you're performing the repair correctly. That's about it for this month's Video Tech. Next month's program will be an update on Bendix anti-lock brake systems. Now that our technician has finished his repair of the governor, I guess it's time to get this road test on the road. See you next time. Hello, and welcome to this edition of Current Service Information. Today, we're going to examine Chrysler's professional educational video disc training system, known as ProEd. It's a comprehensive, interactive, level three computer system for training sales, service, and parts personnel, and is available to all dealers. In this program, we'll give you an overview of the system and its hardware, look at some of its operating procedures, and finally, we'll introduce you to one of the program libraries known as FAST, Fundamental Automotive System Training. Since most of us, myself included, are somewhat intimidated by something new, I'd like to assure you right up front that the ProEd Video Disc Training System is easy to use and allows you to receive training without leaving the dealership. To begin with, you won't have to know about computers or computer terminology. What you will need our basic keyboard skills, your interest in the subject material, and your index finger, so that you can interact through the system's TV monitor that's touch sensitive. I'll show you how to do this in a few simple steps during the next few minutes. The ProEd video disc system is one-on-one -on -one training that's easy to use. Although there may be some time simulations, the system's been designed so that no one's pushing you and nobody's looking over your shoulder. So before getting into how to use the system and the level three courses you can take, I'd like to briefly familiarize you with the ProEd system hardware. The brain is a personal computer that gives the system the capability to manage course presentation, check and record learner progress, and send test scores electronically to Chrysler for training credit. This 13-inch touch-sensitive TV monitor enables you to interact through a special touch computer screen. A conventional typewriter keyboard is also included and allows you to perform specific functions needed for program interaction. Finally, after inserting the program disc, the interactive video disc player works with the personal computer, the touch screen, and the keyboard to present the material. Upon completion of some of the courses, training credit of up to eight hours can be applied toward your Technician Recognition Program, or TRP, and other service and parts training objectives. One important and quick way to attain some of your training credit is through FAST, 
fundamental automotive systems training courses offered through the ProEd interactive video disc system. FAST is an extensive interactive video disc library. Courses will include such subjects as electricity, fuel injection, automatic and manual transaxles, brakes, steering and suspension, and air conditioning to name a few. This is a continuing education program that benefits not only the dealership, but more importantly, you in your quest for personal recognition and job knowledge. ProEd training is also available for service and parts personnel through the Mopar Management Education Library. Courses include a three-part service advisor series covering the repair order, being a star performer, which takes service advisors beyond the process of just taking an order, and more than a survivor, which deals with communication skills. Other courses will include a service management series, a parts management series, and warranty administration. The purpose of these courses are to educate service and parts personnel on the basics of good business. This will increase customer satisfaction with your dealership and ultimately your profitability. Now, let's see how to use the ProEd system for level three training. Your ProEd administrator at the dealership will already have loaded and installed the various programs onto the computer, which you'll be taking. If it is not loaded, check for proper procedures in the operations manual or on the inside of the disc cover. The ProEd administrator will also have entered your name and social security number into the computer. From then on, your social security number becomes your code to enter the system. He'll also provide you with a few fundamentals to get you going, such as how to start the computer by turning on the power strip and the proper way of inserting a video disc. After initial startup, the first screen that will come up is the main menu. Here you have the opportunity to select one of the following applications using the space bar. Run a level three application, run a level two application, perform administrative functions, connect to Chrysler for dial inquiries, connect to Chrysler to send student files, exit this menu. In this case, we'll select run a level three application and press enter. The next menu lists all of the level three programs that are installed in the system. Use the space bar to move the cursor until the program you wish to take is highlighted. Then, install the appropriate video disc in the player, taking care not to get oil or other contaminants on the disc. Now, to load properly, depress the reject open button on the video disc player. Pull the disc table out slowly. Then, set the video disc on the disc table with the proper label side down. Gently close the table, and the player will engage the video disc automatically. When properly loaded, Press Enter. Next, the system will ask you if you wish to take the course for credit or not. If you select N for no, you're not taking it for credit, but rather to increase your knowledge in a specific area. You won't be tested on the material. You'll receive an index that allows you to quickly get to different parts of the course you want to know more about. But let's assume you want the credit. You'll select Y for yes. At this point, you will need to enter your social security number. If the system does not recognize it, you will be asked to try again. After two attempts, the system will ask you to please contact the system administrator to enter your social security number in the system. Once registered, you will then be asked to confirm today's date by pressing Y for yes or N for no. If you answer no, it will ask you to enter the correct date in either case, you'll receive a warning display explaining that if you turn off the machine without properly exiting the course, your scores will be lost. Pressing the space bar will start the course. At this point, the title of the course and the title of the video disc will be displayed to confirm that you have inserted the proper disc. Touch the screen to make your selection. One option you'll want to select, at least for the first time, is the user introduction. 
This option explains what interactive courses are all about. The objective of the courses, course structure, testing and scoring, and what the control buttons, these little symbols, stand for. The interactive courses are highly structured, which means that you follow a well-planned path to make each step as clear as possible and to eliminate any potential confusion. You're now ready to begin your first lesson. Each course comes with one or more lessons which vary in length. With the course menu displayed, you can select different options on the screen, such as being able to take this fast course training exam for credit one time only without having to take any of the lessons. Or a course overview that will give you in capsulized in form an idea of what the course is all about. Once you're done, return to the course menu and select lesson one to begin. In some courses, such as the one displayed, you would receive a pretest at this point. This allows you to see how much you know about the subject before taking the lesson for credit. And you can use it to evaluate your progress during the course. To respond to the test questions, all you have to do is touch what you think the correct answer is, and the computer will record it. At the end of the test, you'll receive your score. You'll also notice that the results are color-coded on the score screen. Red meaning you need review, yellow meaning you should review, and green meaning very good. Should you score 100% on the pretest, you don't have to take that lesson. You can go right on to the next lesson. If you pass the pretests for all the lessons, you can go right on to the test for credit. However, if you didn't get all the answers correct, move to lesson one and begin. At any time during the lesson, you can pause by pressing pause on the screen. And its basic principles. You'll learn about... You can also replay the program to review what you've seen and heard. Or move through the program. In order to understand you can also look at your scores whenever this button appears on the screen. This might be a good time to let you know that you can stop a lesson at any time. Let's say you've got to get back to work. You simply log out and any scores you've accumulated will be saved. Another system feature that helps you learn is the course glossary. At any time during the lesson, if there is a term that needs explaining, you simply go back to the course menu by touching pause and menu. Then press glossary. The glossary gives you a short definition for many of the terms used in the lesson. For example, let's say we wanted to review direct current. You simply touch the term direct current. Once you've completed the lesson, you're ready for the lesson post-test. This is another helpful feature of the system because it allows you to compare your pre- and post-test scores and evaluate how much you've improved. When you're finished with all the lessons in the course, you're ready to take the training credit exam. This exam asks questions from all of the lessons you took in the course. As an example, if you were to pass this fast course by at least 85%, you would earn up to eight hours of training credit. Furthermore, this information is then stored in the system, and once a month, it is automatically sent to Chrysler through the dial system so that you and your dealership can be credited. In the case of FAST, you will receive a letter and a sticker that identifies what course you have completed and the amount of training credit you have received. The sticker is to be placed in your passport. Well, that's all there is to it. A few simple steps on a structured path and you'll have gained knowledge or reinforced what you already know and get training credit for it. The ProEd Fast and Mopar Management Education Level 3 programs, an easy, convenient way to supplement your training. They can help you become a more professional professional and make your dealership a better place to work. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time on Chrysler's Current Service Information.